What is going on, people? We are Tottenham TV here, back again for some more content for you guys. And as Spurs aren't playing this weekend, it's our favourite time of year where we get your unpopular opinions and we react to it in the studio. Joining me today's video is Barnaby Slater from the Spur Dog Podcast. How are you doing, Barnaby? Looking forward to this video? I'm looking forward to the video. Mm -hmm. I haven't had a good week, though, after last weekend's result. And... Uh... Let's face it, it's depressing to be off for two weeks. Usually it's for international break, which is depressing enough, but it's not even that. And we have the prospect of having to watch Chelsea potentially win a trophy with Pochettino as well, which would be nightmare above nightmare. Yeah, but look, I'm sure a lot of angry Spurs fans after ending this little mini break with a defeat. But let's see what you have got to say with the unpopular opinions. It's always one of my favourite types of content. I love reacting to what you guys have to say. So let's get straight into it. Um, the first one we're going to be talking about is Talk THFC. He says, we should have kept Regulon as we have no backup left back. Now, Regulon, we were all ready to see him go, weren't we, at the beginning of the season? I think it's fair to say. We missed it. Look, could we have used him against the Wolves game? Uh, against Wolves, sorry. We had Ben Davis in that game. Regulon played been playing quite well for Brentford recently, although Man United had no interest in keeping him on. Yeah, I thought Ben Davis did all right, actually, which is always a dangerous thing to say amongst Spurs fans, of course. But I think he did okay. I thought it was Emerson Royal had the worst game mm. of the two of them. I thought it was very clear with uh, Sergio Regulon straight from the start when Big Ange came in that he just didn't think he was good enough at what he needed his fullbacks to do for the system. And, you know, him going on two loans already this season mm. kind of shows that. I think he's kind of perfect for Brentford, to be honest. He's playing well for them, getting forward quite well. But as ever with Reggion, it's kind of his final ball that isn't great. Mm. Um, so I can see why Talk THFC has said it. But I think Ben Davis mm -hmm. as, a, as, a per, as a player, but also I think as a leader within the dressing room, is probably that's probably one of the reasons why Big Ange chose to keep him and let Sergio go elsewhere. Yeah, I think I agree with you. I think the way Brentford play, Reguilón doesn't need to be like the best going forward. He just has to be very hardworking, be very aggressive, have a lot of pace, and run a lot, which he loves to do. So I think I think I completely agree. That's why he's putting in some really good performances. And I think Davis as well. He's a bit more of a composed player, which playing in that kind of inverted fullback role maybe works. But I do think sometimes, obviously, he's not the paciest player. And when you're inverted and you're leaving all that space, it can work against you if you're you know getting hit very quickly by certain players like Pedro Neto, yeah. which definitely worked against us on the weekend. But um, Ben. Uh, um, Reguilon wasn't a great defender either. He's not a great mm. defender either. He, he kind of made some bad decisions quite regularly, I thought. So, yeah, I can see why you said it, but not for me. All right, next one comes from Big Ange is Midar, mate. Um, they say a small but vocal minority of Spurs fan of the Spurs fan base actively enjoy it when we lose or don't play well as it validates their own negative opinions like we, we we do always see it isn't it after a loss there are all these fans you know they tend to call out players who they've been calling out like see I told you about this player I told you about yeah. that um, do you notice a, a, some section of the fan base who seem to take glee when we do end up on a bad side of a result. Uh, I think a lot of this is like, like we're literally getting these from Twitter and a lot of this is just <laughs> on Twitter, on enough. X in general. Like, yes, there are lots of people who realize that they get more traction from their comments and tweets if it goes badly and they have negative opinions because they know that they're going to, you know, get more people following them and stuff like that. But I think in general, if you're at the ground, it's very rare that you'll kind of come across somebody who is that negative that they actually mm. want the team to do badly. Um, so I don't really see it as realistic. Uh, it's just kind of a corner of the fan base that has, you know, come through social media. I completely agree. I think it's a social media thing. I think every fan base probably has these yeah. kind of fans who have, who kind of have a set agenda against a player when they sign. For example, let's say like Werner, they think Werner's a bad signing. And then whenever he has a bad game, they like to, you know, tell everyone how right they were about the, that bad signing. So I think... People have, people are like that on social media, and if you spend too much time with it, you're going to think a, a large section of the fan base are like that. But I agree, you match day going fans usually they're usually very very positive, and they don't like to have bad experiences at the exactly. ground, especially. Yeah, exactly. And Timo Werner, I think you know, because you brought him up, it's worth saying, you know, he's very much an opportunistic signing. I think mm -hmm. more than anything else, and. Like, do I think he's going to rip up trees and score 10 goals between now and the end of the season? I don't. But I also think in terms of squad depth, it's it was a signing worth doing. And I think it'll mm. prove, continue to prove to be so. 
All right, next one. Fan of sports. Um, I guess he likes a lot of sports, he says. Um, he says, our system of play has been found out by other clubs. Unless we start getting standout performances from our front line, we'll be out of Europe by the end of the season. Um, maybe a bit reactionary, given you know some of our performances <laughs> uh, haven't been great recently. Well, but what is interesting, what I've noticed... Everyone's been talking about how bad we've been playing recently or like our bad form. I looked at the form table. The last 10 games, we were third in the form yeah, table, yeah. which is quite, which you wouldn't believe considering how we're talking about. But um, yeah, I don't think it's any secret that the last few games definitely have, we haven't been at our best. No. We've definitely been quite open uh, at the back. We haven't been creating that many chances. So are you, is any part of you worried, that, like fan of sports is saying, that maybe teams are starting to work out the system? I don't think it's that we've been found out. I don't think anything's really changed other than the fact that our kind of front six aren't scoring as many goals as they were earlier in the season, right? So, you know, a lot of how we play, especially if we're coming up against teams who play a low block, is how quickly can we get that first goal? How quickly can we come out the blocks? Can we put them under pressure where they, the opposition have to change their tactic? And uh, in the last few games, we haven't scored early goals. We mm -hmm. haven't created that momentum and pressure. And so I don't really feel like it's about being found out. I think, you know, teams were playing low blocks against us at the start, but Madison was on form, hadn't been injured. He's still working his way back. Sonny was playing as the nine and we were creating loads of chances for him. And at the moment, it's just not quite clicking. Mm. But hopefully this kind of two weeks of just training for them and the opportunity for, say, Bentoncourt and Madison to kind of really get fitter we'll see a return to that kind of early season form. Mm. Yeah, I think found out is a because it, it kind of it kind of implies like this way of playing is d doomed to fail once teams work it out and then once that happens we're not going to be able to overcome those challenges. I think it's just a case of we're not perfect in the way we play at the moment. Mm -hmm. Teams are exploiting that right now. Yes, we uh, we have a lot of good players and stuff, but we're still like it's still very early in the, not very early, but it's still early in Ange's project. So we're not going to be have perfected this system, especially with all the challenges we're playing, and also just cause. You know, just because players are back from injury and what and back from international tournaments doesn't mean they're one hundred percent match fit and ready to go as well. So I never expected just as soon as the players are back, we're going to be hitting the ground running. I still expected maybe a couple of games to find their rhythm and all that kind of stuff. So I think found out is a bit maybe going too far when it comes to our performances recently. Yeah, it's a bit concerning, I guess, the fact that the when the players have come back, we haven't seemed to have gotten better. But I do think. It, with time, I think this little break will help us. And yeah. with time, we will start playing, we'll start looking sharper, more intense, and the performances will come, I'm sure of it. Yeah. I don't think it's a case of being found out. And if I was going to ask fan of sports a question, I'd say when he says we'll be out of Europe by the end of the season, does he mean top four or does he mean like all the European <laughs> places? Because I think we're pretty nailed on to get kind of top seven, mm -hmm. which I think is what the conference league will go down to. Mm -hmm. I'd be very surprised if we didn't come top six. Now, Man United have put a run of games together, but they're still not very good. Like they're mm -hmm. not playing very well and they're just kind of sneaking over the line. I don't know. I still feel relatively confident we'll finish above Manchester United. And I was saying to Sim, and I'm sure we'll get onto this before we came on, I, I quite fancy us to go to Villa and get a win there. Mm. And uh, I think we'll finish above them as well. Yeah. It was, it was interesting to know, I was looking at last season and we're actually only two points better off uh, this point this season as last season. But the diff the caveat would be for the last 13 games of the season last season, we only picked up 15 points. Yeah. I'm pretty sure we're going to pick up more than and that. And also, season. I'm actually watching the games now, whereas <laughs> last season it was such dross that I basically wasn't turning up to my season ticket that I had. Which, Don't you know, think, yeah. I'm ashamed to say it, but uh, blame Antonio Conte. Don't think you're the only one. Um, next one is Justin Glasser. He says, Manuel Solomon is the best Ange winger at the club. Mm. It is a bit of a problem that I think people are picking up that a lot of our wingers... Like how Ange likes to play his wingers, you know, very wide. They get in a lot of one-on-one -on -one situations because we manipulate the play with the inverted fullbacks to basically get those wingers in one-on-one -on -one situations. Yep. And it is a bit of an elephant in the room, the fact that um, Son, Werner, Kulisevsky and Johnson, as much as they have their attributes, one of their, I don't think any of their strong attributes is dribbling at fullbacks in one-on-one yep. -on -one situations. Explosive dribbling, yeah. So does he, do you think he has a case that Manuel Solomon maybe could be the best fit? Well, Manuel Solomon is like the forgotten man. I, yeah. I almost totally forgot that we have Manuel Solomon <laughs> and I haven't actually seen enough of him to say that he's the best and winger in the team. But I can see why you've made the point, Justin, because I've been calling on the watch-alongs on, on this channel, actually. I've been calling a lot for us to buy that kind of player, an explosive 
dribbly winger who can beat a player on the outside um, and give something different. And actually, yeah, I, I think Manor Solomon's about to be back in training Correct. Uh, in the next week or so. So maybe that is an option that we will use. It'll, it'll, it'll certainly give us something a bit different on the bench. I can't see him starting in reality. But I think we are getting close to that, uh, especially with the performance against Wolves of Richarlison with his back to goal and holding the ball up. I think we are getting close to that question of whether should we look at playing Sonny back in the nine, even if that initially means moving Richarlison to the left, mm -hmm. first of all. Be interesting to see if Big Ange and uh, his coaching team are thinking about that with Palace coming up next week. I think when it comes to Manuel Solomon, I think in terms of profile, logically, there maybe is a case to say he could technically be the most um, kind of fit profile wise for an Ange winger. But I kind of feel like with this, with, with this tweet, it's kind of, it's a bit like absence makes the heart grow fonder Definitely. a bit. Yeah. And it's like, uh, I feel like all the time, whenever there's an injured player and, and we're not playing well, it's like, oh, this guy, yeah. when he comes back from an injury and it's always like this savior, but then they come back and it's never the reality. You know who else was brilliant at beating a man? Really? Lucas Moura. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And I don't think any of us would, would want him in this squad at the moment That's like no point. no shade on Lucas Moura like he had his benefits and obviously in Amsterdam was unbelievable but he could beat a player but then once he'd done that you know nine times out of ten what he did next was not good enough and I need to see more of Mana Solomon to see whether his final ball can improve enough for that kind of profile of player to be useful because it's one thing beating a player but then if he's hitting the first man every time or hacking it out for a goal kick then it, it doesn't matter so I'm looking forward to seeing more of him for sure uh, Stats you I think it's pronounced. Apologies if I butchered that. He says, or they say, despite a great goal scoring record in recent times, Charleston shouldn't be our starter. If we want to be back on the heights of the first 10 games, we need Son to be the striker. Richarlison, obviously, off the back now, I think it's now nine goals in his last 10 or 11 games. Mm. Obviously, he hasn't scored in his last two. Mm. Um, has hit a really rich vein of form. I think his performance level as well in general has been really improving apart from maybe the Wolves game. But do you think I, I would argue that maybe we looked our most fluid when Son is playing in that number nine. Mm -hmm. But is it a big issue? Like, are we not, are we not going to have not going to see our performances improve until that happens? I mean, one thing that's worth talking about with Rishi is that he his pressing is absolutely incredible mm. and he works really hard. Um, I do think there's a little bit of an element with Spurs at the moment, and I'm and Spurs fans, and I'm guilty of this as well because we had Harry Kane for so long. We are now kind of basically putting Richarlison's form up against mm. what we're used to. Whereas at any other club, if, if Richarlison was playing at any other club now, say he was playing for Brentford and he'd scored the amount of goals he'd scored, people would be talking about him moving to a bigger club mm. because that's scoring 10 goals in the Premier League. It actually doesn't happen that often. Not many players get to 10 goals and I think he will get to 15 goals. So his back, it, it's only his kind of back to goal hold up play that I have an issue with and uh, it had improved, and then he just did ha did have a bad game. And that's why, you know, maybe bring him out to the left, I don't know. But, you know, Ange sees him every day. Ange sees, sees Sonny every day, and I back Ange to make the right decision. And like I said, I've been saying it for a while, I think Richarlison will get to 15 league goals, and that will be an incredible return for him, I think. I think the issue uh, a lot of people have when, when it comes to who should play where in the front in the front line is Son is our best left winger and our best striker. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel. So yeah. I don't think the problem is Richarlison playing up front. I think the problem is who plays on the left because it just feels like Son at the moment, as much, I, lo I love him, I just don't think he's a great left winger right now uh, mm -hmm. anymore. As much as I do think he can still do a job, I don't think that's his best position. And then, but if it's not him, it's either Werner or Solomon and they're not quite cutting it as well. So it's a bit, that's an issue, but I think Son or Richarlison up front, I, I like both of them. I there. think, I think Sonny on the left wing is a really good player if it's a game where there's loads of space and mm -hmm. you're not playing against a deep block. So against Villa, it wouldn't surprise me if Sonny had a similar game to what he did against Newcastle mm. um, where he was really getting at his fullback and there was some space um, but yes against that low block Sonny doesn't have that explosive pace to go around the outside really anymore um, so maybe that comes back to the Manuel Solomon thing maybe mm. you know it'll be against those deep block teams that we'll see him um, but yes you know Sonny is our best left winger and our best nine but uh, Richarlison's doing a good enough job at nine to to keep him there for, for now I think Greg says we should start with a back three of Van de Ven Romero and Dragushin with Destiny and Pedro as wing backs, then Madders and Sar in midfield, and a front three of Sonny, Richie, and Decky. Mate, <laughs> would you consider a change in formation? Some like 
I guess maybe it's a reaction to s some n maybe less than perfect performances. Maybe that's why he's saying we should change formation. But sometimes a change of formation just just freshen things up a bit and just make some more ideas. Mm. Dragushin does need some minutes. Maybe is he starting to get frustrated on the bench? Is there a case to move to a back three? I'm a bit triggered and scarred from the back three of Antonio <laughs> Conte for so long. Like before Conte came, I'd been saying for years, we need to play with a back three. And then Conte came and I was like, it's going to be perfect. Eric, Eric Dyer can play in the middle. It's a perfect role for him, et cetera, et cetera. And then we just played such turgid football in a back three. I personally think, uh, I don't know, Greg, so we'll, we'll see. But a lot of things that I read on Twitter at the moment about Dragushi needing to play and stuff, it's like your new toy, isn't it? Everybody mm. wants to see the new <laughs> toy. But in reality, to to play a back three just to give this player minutes, that's not a reason to do it. And the reason we're playing 4-3-3 is because that's what Ange thinks is best suited to the players we've got. And I do not foresee that changing anytime soon. Um, and, you know, Ange wants to have four players in central midfield. That's why he inverts the fullbacks. And to just have Madders and Saar in midfield, I don't think would cover us quite enough. Um, so I just can't see it at the moment. Could be inverting wing backs instead of inverting yeah. full backs. Maybe that'll, that'll yeah. be interesting. Um, Dalper says Romero is our most talented defender ever from 2000 onwards. Mm. Well, ever from 2000. So two conflicting uh, phrases there. But I guess who who's in competition competition with Ledley King, Jan Vertonghen, Toby, Toby Alderweireld. Gary Doherty. Uh, Gary, Do yeah. Well, maybe not. Maybe not the Ginger Pele. I don't think he quite makes it. But, um, is he our most talented defender? Some Define even are talented. I think yeah, is I the, guess. the thing here. Some people even argue he's not the most talented defender under the club right now, let alone since two thousand. Um, I, would, I think I would, talented. I'd still put Deadly King above him. I, I would say what Romero does have that we haven't had in a centre half is the bravery on the ball to play those balls in between the lines into midfield. Mm. Um, and kind of really draw out the opposition press. Obviously, when Ledley was playing, that kind of way of playing wasn't a thing. Ledley was very gifted on the ball and did play defensive midfield quite a lot for us as well. But I think Romero is a better passer than Ledley King. But in terms of like pure talent as a defender, Ledley King was, you know, if Ledley King could have trained, if Ledley King <laughs> wasn't injured and hadn't done his knee, I think he did his knee like at the age of 23 or yeah. something, really young. Um, you know, it's no coincidence um, that Thierry Henry talks about Ledley King being the hardest defender he came up against. Ledley in this team, if he was fit right now at Spurs, wow. I think our, when Ledley King was fit, like our record with him was like so good. I remember even like even under Harry Redknapp and yeah. like when he would come into the team, even though he would only be fit for half the season, those would be like our 20 best games of the season when he would be fit. He was just so great. So I, I think Romero... Also, what Ledley King has over Romero is like Romero's like sometimes, I'm not saying he's all like this, but sometimes he can be a bit rash. Sometimes he gets a rush of blood to the head. Ledley mm. King never really had that. He right. was always so calm, so composed. And as Thierry Henry would, used to say, he used to take the ball uh, from you without you even knowing. Yeah. Romero definitely doesn't do that. He mm. makes sure you know. That's to for sure. Totally different players, both <laughs> yeah. incredibly talented. I just think, you know, maybe I'm a bit older than, than uh, Dalper is. I don't know. But, you know, Ledley King was basically our our only good player for a long time. Yeah, yeah um, good point. And he was incredibly talented. Uh, but Romero, you know, World Cup winner, mm. incredibly gifted. So it's, it's, a, it's a close one. Different players, both brilliant. Gary D. Spurs says, Madison and Bentencourt can't play in the same team. They take up the same positions when we have the ball in and around the penalty area. Just a thought. Um, I think it's way too early to say that. They've barely played together. So I don't know if I, I don't see why they would take take up the same spaces in the in the pitch. Madison's obviously a lot more of a number 10 offensive kind of play, although he does like to drop deep. But I think that's a reaction to maybe have we, have, we probably haven't won a game since Madison and Bentacle played together but mm. um I don't know do you see any do you see any reason why they can't play together no I wouldn't have thought I wouldn't have thought so it shouldn't be an issue neither of them have really been fit whilst having the opportunity to play with each other both coming back from injuries so you know there is on paper absolutely no reason why they they shouldn't be able to play together because they're mm. both you know brilliantly talented international footballers it's just about finding the right blend in that midfield isn't it really mm. and um you know, and the right blend for each individual game as well. And I, and I do wonder actually whether, in hindsight, with that Wolves game, could we maybe have put you know been a bit more creative in that midfield? Like mm -hmm. Madison was pretty much on his own in terms of creativity, and Loselso was on the bench. And I did wonder, you know, could we do what he did in the second half? I think it was against Brentford, where he had kind of two more mm -hmm. creative players alongside. I think he brought on Hoiberg to play in the six, and then played two creators. And actually, 
now hindsight's a wonderful thing, but now we lost anyway. I just feel like, oh, I wish we'd kind of gone for it a little bit more. But um, no, I can I can definitely envisage Madders and Bentancourt playing well together. Mm. Next one is from The Elite Estimator. He says, Europa League spot would be better for the academy players in Champions League. Although I want top four for the signings, Phillips, Donnelly and other young players would get much more game time um, against lower clubs. Like, uh, I think, obviously, I think that's probably true. If we win Europa League, there will probably be more opportunities for the academy players. But... Um, is there a case like if we're in the Champions League is it, and we're still restricting these chances for players like Donnelly and Phillips and maybe a Divine or whoever's coming in, like how do we go about developing them if we can't give them the game time? I think it's difficult. If you look at Liverpool now, they've got this kind of rush of young players mm. coming into the team, but it's only because they've got injuries. Yeah. That's the only reason they're playing. It's, it's like if you're, you've just got to be good enough. And look, I, I don't watch... The academy a lot so mm -hmm. i don't know how good jamie donnelly is or um, ashley phillips is or alfie dorrington but what i do know is if they're good enough and will play them that that is the reality of it for me um i wouldn't be so sure that if we get in the europa league he'll play a load of youth players i don't mm -hmm. think that you know that hasn't really happened at spurs since probably you know harry kane got the nods away mm -hmm. at hearts and you know that kind of era of livermore and kane and um mason. winks and ryan mason yeah. Uh, Winks was a bit after, wasn't he? Uh, mm. Jake Livermore, etc. Tom et Carroll. Et Tom Carroll. Um, but bear in mind, back then we weren't very good, so it was mm. easier then to play. Whereas now we're building a squad where it's not going to be players like Donnelly who's going to play in the Europa League next year. It's going to be players like Dragushin, and it's going to mm. be players like Bergvall and mm. and and those kind of players. So, um, look, I think it's more important that we build ourselves up into a bigger club with a better depth of squad, and then you say to those youth players. If you want to play in this team, you've got to be better than the player who's got the shirt at the moment. That, and that's that's the, the right way to do it, in my opinion. Liam says, Ben Tenkel is without doubt our best number six. He has a couple of bad games in there, um, there recently, but that's due to a lack of fitness and sharpness. With him and Basuma competing that position, we do not need to sign another number six. Um there's been a lot of a bit of there's been a bit of debate, hasn't there, about where, where Ben Tenkel's best position is. And obviously Basuma we know has been off form now for a while, which is a bit concerning. Um, I thought Basuma played well other than being responsible single-handedly for their second goal. <laughs> I actually agree. I thought he was, a lot of people were, may, maybe it's because he's in bad form and then he, he has that moment and people uh, grab onto it. Yeah. Um, considering where both players are at the moment, do you, do you feel the need, like in the summer, we need to get a specialised number six? Or are you still confident going forward, Basuma and Bentancourt kind of have that position covered? I think Benzica is more of an eight, personally. Mm. Um, I think if we're going to buy another six, it'll be because we're going to let Hoiberg go and it'll be a six. We were actually linked with Gomez, who scored those two goals, weren't we, mm. a few weeks ago? Yeah. And he's kind of a, a more of a natural, like a six in the way Hoiberg is, but also with a good pass and mm. good vision and a bit of skill. Um, so that's why I could see us buying a six, is if they let Hoiberg out the door and then it'll be between the new signing and Basuma, I think, personally. I think Basuma is more of a natural six, certainly in terms of the way he gets the ball off the back four and starting the kind of process. But is he an enforcer? No, I wouldn't say so. But like I said, you know, I thought actually he had a pretty good game other than just his tracking back for that goal was uh, shameful. In terms of Bentacle, though, in the, in the number six, like that was his position when he was at Juventus. But right. I felt like he took his game up a level when he was playing under Conte last season in that kind of box-to-box -box role, taking a bit more responsibility on the ball. That's what a lot of people used to say at Juventus. He used to kind of hide a bit in terms of, he used to like to take the ball and release it quickly, but and not like carry with it. Yeah. And then he brought that into his game. And I thought that's where we saw the best of him. So that's why I want to see him in that number eight position. He's got but a great engine. I think it's between, mm. it should be between him and Saar as to, to mm. who plays in each game for that number eight. Mm. Um, and he's a really good finisher as well. And the last one for this episode, this is going to be from FX, um, MFXRCH. Uh, I don't know what that stands for, but he says, I always felt like Bergvine and Danjuma, uh, we did Bergvine and Danjuma dirty with their time at Spurs. And I think they would both flourish under Ange in the brackets. I'm not saying I think we should uh, either bring either of them back. I feel like we messed up with both of them, perhaps a case of right guys and wrong time. If you do you reckon Bergvine or Danjuma in this system under Ange, maybe there there could be something there. Yeah, I've said it previously. I think Bergvine would really have flourished under Ange Postacoglu because he was a real swag player. You know, like mm. we just needed to give him more games and more confidence. He never really had that. I think Danjuma wasn't very good, 
So, I'm, you know, controversial take here, but he doesn't really get in the Everton team either. Mm. And I remember before he came to Spurs watching him in, I think, that Europa League final. Was it, were they in the fight? Was it Villarreal yeah. against Man United? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just remember thinking, oh God, he's dross. Like he, he looks so exciting, but then his final ball is poor. And I remember at Spurs when he was there and everyone was, you know, like again, the shiny new toy, desperate mm. for him to get on the pitch. Why isn't Dan Juman playing? Why isn't it? And I'm like, well, because the manager sees him every training session. He's clearly not good enough. Um, but, but that's my opinion on Dan Juma. But I think Steven Bergwijn, it's kind of a shame. What do we get from 20 million in the end? Yeah. There's We've rumors got... of him going to West Ham, aren't yeah, there? There were. There were rumors yeah. already that Ajax want to let him go. I don't think he's actually pulled up any trees at Ajax. Yeah, he's been but, okay. But, but... but he's playing in a terrible Ajax team. That's isn't also he? true. Um, but uh, I wouldn't be, it wouldn't surprise me to see him back in the Premier League, that's for sure. I think they probably, if they were in the team now, definitely do better than when they were here under Conte. Um, but I don't. I still don't think they're actually. The, the aunt, they would have been the answer to what we want in those positions anyway. So uh, I think they're both... I, I, I think Bergvine's a good player. I think Dan Juma is actually underrated, but I, you know, he's not been great for Everton. He wasn't good for us. So means I don't... Him, I, means not, him fighting over Dan Juma here, <laughs> scrapping. I don't mind Dan Juma. I think I, think I like, really liked him at Villarreal when they were in that... When, when they, that season they got to the Champions League semi-final, I thought he was really good. But... I don't think, and like we're revising their careers in terms of what they could have done. I don't think those guys right now are like top, top level players in my opinion. So uh, I don't, I'm not really bothered it hasn't worked out. So anyway, look, that is it for episode one of Unpopular Opinion. Stay tuned. There'll be further episodes coming. Uh, we're releasing on the channel very, very shortly. But like, subscribe, a comment. And as always, come on, you Spurs. <laughs>